He's risen. risen You can have a seat. You know, I wish our worship team could bring a little more energy, don't you? (laughs) My goodness. Uh, My team's giving me a hard time that I need to stop singing or I'm not going to be able to preach by the next service. But I keep telling them that'll be okay. I'll just sound like a raspy smoker. And, you know, then you guys can all start rumors about me from that perspective. Sound good? All right. So here's the interesting thing to me. On Easter Sunday, the only people that were worried about where Jesus was, chief priests, teachers of the law. They were the ones that talked to Pilate. They were the ones that were concerned about whether or not Jesus' body was going to be stolen. They were the ones that were having conversations about sealing the tomb. They were the ones that were writing some things off and having some conversations behind closed doors. The reality is, is that the women, they were on their way to the tomb in order to be able to anoint Jesus' body with spices and prepare it for burial since they couldn't do it since the Passover had started. The disciples, they were scared to death. And so they're sitting up in a room because they're afraid that they might be next. And so they're just waiting for a knock on the door where everything's going to go badly for them. I was thinking to myself, as we're going through this series called Goats, some people have asked me, Tim, why do you compare Jesus to the goats? And I'm like, we're not talking about the animal, the goat. We're talking about the acronym, the goat, the greatest of all time. And though Jesus was one who led with humility, what we recognize is that the reason Jesus is the greatest of all time is because he's taking care of the greatest need of all time. And he accomplished it on the cross. And he accomplished it when he walked out of that tomb. I was thinking to myself about this whole idea as we close out this series with these two word kinds of things about descriptions of Jesus. And I thought to myself, he's the greatest grave robber there ever was. When I was in high school, I found myself regularly doing research on Egypt. I just found it to be a fascinating culture. As a young man, I found it fascinating that they could embalm bodies and they'd last for centuries, even millennia. But what's fascinating about this particular culture is if you go there today and go through any of the pyramids that are there, you're not going to find any bodies there. And as a matter of fact, all of the riches that were in the pyramids have been stolen. And it says something about who we are when you even think back to an ancient culture like Egypt. You see, those pharaohs would bury themselves with all of these goodies because they expected that one day they would wake up in eternity and they wanted to make sure that they had all of their wealth and their power with them. And what's interesting to me is that bumper sticker that I saw 20, 30 years ago still holds true today. He who dies with the most toys still dies. Grave robbing has been happening for centuries. And when you see a tomb like this one, This always draws attention to us of thinking about that moment on Good Friday when Joseph of Arimathea came and asked Pilate for the body and put him in his tomb and sealed it. The part of the story that we don't tend to talk about is this section. In Matthew 27, it says, The next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver, think about that, the deceiver, said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Let's make sure the tomb's secure. Have you ever heard the phrase, bless your heart? I think that is a pretty good statement here. I think there was a side of God that was just looking at Pilate and these chief priests and these Pharisees and his disciples that are freaked out, the women that are going to the tomb to anoint his body. And there's got to be a side of God that on the one hand is going, my goodness, our people just don't get it. And yet on the other hand, in this moment, this critical moment where Jesus from the cross declared, it is finished, the temple curtain torn to revealing for the first time to all people that there was no separation between God and man, that you didn't have to go through any mediator because what Jesus did on the cross was once for all time and he declared from there, it is finished. The soldiers at the bottom of the cross as the earthquake took place said, surely this man was the son of God. But what were they worried about? The disciples might steal his body. So let's go secure the tomb. The part of the story that goes even further that we don't even think about is this one. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal. This was a seal of Pilate's. And then they put guards on either side. 
And what's interesting is when you get to the, uh, the story where the angels are there, Jesus' body is gone, the stone is rolled away, and the guards don't know what happened because they were so frightened when the, the angels showed up and the tomb opened up that they were like dead men is what Scripture says. So then this is what happened. We've got a scandal on our hands. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say this. His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Good luck with that story. You see, the whole point was, the first deception according to the chief priests and Pharisees was that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. The second deception that they were worried about was that he was actually going to rise from the dead. And then he did. Can you imagine being in this spot where you're trying to figure out how do we shut this thing down? And we have no ability to stop this story to the point where here we are in April of 2023, gathered together in this room, recognizing that Jesus died, but he didn't stay in that grave. He walked out of it. He did. Here's the crazy part. Who cares? I just saw a study. It was done in 2022 of American adults. And in that study, it said that well over two-thirds of American adults believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that that was an actual historical fact that it happened. But what's frightening to me is in the same study, less than a third, less than a third, believe that it matters for their daily living. Is that you? society that walks into this room and says, Tim, tell me how this makes any difference for today because the ham's in the oven and I'm getting hungry. Well, let me tell you something. There's a bigger part to this story than just the fact that some man by the name of Jesus walked out of a grave. Because he wasn't just man, he was also God, and what he accomplished on that cross was paying the eternal penalty for years in my sin for all time. And then when he walked out of the grave, it was this promise that all things will be made new. All things. There's power in that. But I think sometimes we step back, and even as you kind of look at the way the story unfolds, Jesus walked around, he introduced himself to hundreds of people, so there's no ability for anybody to deny that Jesus walked out of the grave. This is not a deception. He was the Son of God, and he is risen. There you go. He is risen indeed. And because he did that, we are people of hope and confidence and peace. And that's the thing that God gives us. It's not just about eternity. It's about today. So I want to be able to share a couple of crazy stories with you because sometimes I think it's helpful for us to be reminded of why it matters. Because Jesus has been in the, in the work of resurrecting people for a long, long time. But the crazy part that we deal with is when you go all the way back to the beginning of time, God made man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into man the breath of life. But what we know to be true is that one day we're all going to wind up back in the ground. And sometimes that frightens us. I found myself over the last two to three days kind of amazed as to the conversations I've been in since Monday, Thursday. I had somebody walk up to me on Monday, Thursday and share with me that they've got a test coming up in the next two weeks that's going to determine some pretty significant issues in their life. I had another person share with me within the last day that uh, their father just had a heart attack and it was so bad that it damaged the heart probably more than 50%. And as this person finds themselves states away, worrying about their dad, wrestling through, what does this mean? And then I had another person call me just yesterday afternoon, and I found myself sitting on my patio for 15 to 20 minutes just listening to somebody tell me that their cancer came back and they probably have a year of life. And I found myself just sort of resting in these stories of people's lives that can feel so dire at moments. And even as we sit in those moments and wrestle through what does this mean, and think through the emotions and all that goes with that, we were also able to sit in a very different place, recognizing that what we celebrate on this day allows Christ followers to be able to walk through situations even like those with unbelievable confidence and peace and hope. Who cares? We do. Who cares? Let me tell you about this crazy guy back in 2 Kings 13. 
Elisha was a great prophet in those days, and he died and he was buried. Now Moabite raiders, that was a group of people off to the, the west side of where Israel was located. Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. And once while some Israelites were burying a man, think about this, burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. So just picture this for a moment with me. I find myself a little bit more humored as I read scripture these days. So here's a group of guys trying to have maybe this, this tender moment with a friend of theirs, maybe a family member, who, who knows? It doesn't even tell us. It's just a man. And then they see a band of raiders come over the, the, the horizon, and they determine, well, here's the best idea. We're just going to throw the guy into uh, Elisha's tomb, and we're going to get out of here. And guess what happens? This is not the story you see at Sunday school. When the body touched Elisha's bo- bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. That's it. They don't tell you what happens next. Don't you have a few questions? Like there's a band of raiders coming. This guy walks out of the tomb. Nobody's there. He's alive. He's probably trying to figure out why am I standing in a tomb right now? And why are those guys there? And they look a little upset. I, and then he has to walk into town and introduce himself to his family. I, I mean, just imagine what's going on. But you want to talk about a guy of hope. You want to talk about a, ta- ta- a town that was a buzz when this man walked in. And sometimes this is the thing we all hope for, right? Stories of resurrection. We love these kinds of stories, and they go further than that. There's a story from Luke chapter 7 where the centurion, I love this particular story because this guy's Roman. So think about where his background might be coming from. He's not even necessarily a believer, but he's heard about this guy named Jesus who apparently is a miracle worker. And so he's got a servant that he loves that is sick, and he's concerned that he's going to die. So he finds Jesus, and he says to him, look, I'm a man under authority. And I understand that when I tell a man to do something, he does it. And so I'm not even asking you to come to my home, Jesus. I'm just saying, say the word, and I know that my servant will be healed. And Jesus looked at him and looked at the rest of the crowd, and he goes, man, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And this guy's not even a believer. Are you kidding me? Look at this guy's faith. And then he looked at the man, and he said, go home. Your servant is healed. And Scripture recounts the fact that when the centurion got home, sure enough, The servant was sitting up taking nourishment. And then it tells the story that when Jesus was walking through a town called Nain, it's a little bit southeast of Nazareth, there was a procession going on. Jesus hadn't even been invited to be a part of this particular funeral. So just imagine like when you're you're seeing a procession take place in Tomball, you don't even know who they are, but you just see the the hearse and all the cars that are following. Or maybe you're at a, a cemetery for whatever reason. You're just visiting your own loved one. You see something else. And Jesus happens to walk into this moment and realizes that this is this widow's only son. He walks up to the casket and simply says, sit up. And the young boy sits up. Jesus is in the work of resurrecting. It's craziness. Imagine what happened in these particular stories as this one's telling, the centurion's telling other Roman folks that maybe are questioning who this Jesus is and this widow who gets her son back. And then there's the story of Jairus. This is also a fascinating story because think in terms of this. Jairus was one of those chief priests, teachers of the law kind of folks. One of these guys that's wrestling with who this Jesus is and why is he blowing up all the paradigms that we're dealing with. And yet in that moment, he had to deal with this miracle man. And he's got a daughter who's sick and is dying, and he finally goes to Jesus, and he's trying to get his attention, and his servants show up, and he says, Jairus, don't don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. And Jesus, not only being man, but the Son of God, overheard the conversation, and he looks at Jairus, and he says, don't worry. Don't you worry. Because, you see, Jesus is in the work of resurrection. And so he went with Jairus to his home, and they walked in, and people were even laughing at Jesus when Jesus said, don't worry, she's just asleep. And he walked in, and he said to the little girl, get up. And she did. And finally, his best friend Lazarus had died, and as this particular story in John 11 goes, Jesus was hanging out with some other folks in a town, and it took him a while to be able to get to where Lazarus was, and he knew that Lazarus wasn't doing well. And by the time he got to where Lazarus was, Lazarus had been dead for three days. And Mary and Martha, his sisters, are kind of upset about the whole thing because Jesus was one of their best friends. I mean, these weren't just, you know, strangers. This wasn't the widow that Jesus didn't know. This wasn't some guy named Jairus. This wasn't some Roman centurion. Like, these were his best friends. And he doesn't show up in their time of need, and now Lazarus is dead. And finally, Jesus looks at her and says, Mary, Martha, trust me. And he goes to the tomb of Lazarus, who'd been in there for several days. They opened up the tomb. Lazarus 
walked out. If you've ever wondered if God is able, my favorite place to go in scripture is in the story of Daniel. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are unwilling to bend the knee to some foreign god or an idol. And because of it, the king's going to throw them into a blazing furnace. And so these guys stand up before the king and they go, look, you can throw us into a blazing furnace, but look at how this thing goes. If we're thrown into this furnace, the God we serve is what? What does that say, everybody? It says, able. The God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, When you ask yourself the question, who cares? I think that's the struggle we have as Christ followers, isn't it? It's the struggle that each one of us in this room probably has walked through a cemetery where a loved one is, and the story didn't end with Jesus raising them from the dead in this life. And in all the rest of those stories that we just heard, those people eventually died. But what we hang on to in this life is that we know how the story ends. And we know because of Jesus we are forgiven. We know that his grace is real. And we know, we know that he cares for us. I've got a woman by the name of Rolita who I've gotten to know over the last 10 years. I'd like to to hear her story as she shares 10 years ago she was looking for a school for her children. And that was her greatest concern, a good education. But God did something remarkable in Rolita's life. Take a look. My name is Rolita Chang. My husband, David, and I own Redfish Seafood Group. I grew up in China. And in China, it was during the Cultural Revolution. And so religion was totally banned. I came here when I was 19 to come to uh, go to university. My father used to work in a ship, so he had seen the whole world, and he didn't want to be in China. The goal was for me to bring them here so that they can retire here. So they they did have a few very good years of retirement, and then my father got sick. He was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer, and watch him suffer was really, really hard. I did question, like, if God is here, why is God not helping him? After my father passed away, I just didn't feel like there was a God. I felt empty and very confused. I was diagnosed with liver cancer, and I was really surprised. I went through a lot of different treatments and lots of trying. Actually, I was uh, rejected by a few doctors for transplant because they think that I wouldn't make it past six months or something. And I did have like five false calls that didn't go through at the end. It's very scary. One day I have a customer came to me and said, you just leave your problem at the foot of the cross. And I did not understand what she meant. And she said, it's not your battle, you just need to leave it to God. And so at the time I was thinking like, how can I leave it to God? This is my life. During the week of my transplant was pretty desperate time for me. Monday, I went to get a scan. Tuesday, I went back to MD Anderson to look at the result. And it was showing that the cancer had progressed. Then they were going to suggest I would do radiation, but the radiation won't happen for two months. I knew I didn't have two months. On Friday, I just couldn't really get out of bed. I just laid there. And then I said, God, I don't know what to do anymore because I have done everything you told me to do. This is your problem, not mine anymore. So that night, came to work, and that's when I got the call. That was my sixth time getting calls, and 
didn't really know my emotion. I'm excited. I was excited, but at the same time, I was very nervous. But somehow that night, I just had this peace. I cannot explain it. So I got to the, the ICU. You know, the nurse was pushing me through, and then they just swing open the door. And that's when I saw Jesus was holding my left hand. And I can see him very, very clearly. He was right there. I got into the OR and they were getting me ready. I said, God, this is yours. If I wake up, that will be great. If I don't wake up, I'm okay. I woke up to seeing my friends, my husband, and our pastors. I knew that I'm gonna be okay. My donor's name is Kelsey. She was eight years old. So my goal is to live a life that worthy of two. I believe Jesus pursued me through my cancer. He pursued me because I was doubting him. He was showing me that he was, he was there with me. I think when we surrendered, that's when Jesus took over. Fascinating that that was April 7th and 8th, 2017, and here we find ourselves on April 9th, 2023. I love the statements that Rolita makes as she walks her own story of wrestling through her father, who Jesus didn't resurrect in this life. And she had to bury him and wrestle through the question of, I thought Jesus was in the business of resurrection. And what we know as Christ followers is that he is. And she said, God pursued me through cancer. It's when we surrender. Think about that. It's when we surrender that God takes over. And I believe this is the quintessential statement that she makes because when we get to this point, God, this is yours. If I wake up, great. If I don't, it's okay. And why is it okay? I'll tell you why it's okay. Because he walked out of that grave. And Rolita hangs on to that with everything that she is. And even in her moments of doubt, God continued to relentlessly pursue her to the point where he used something as frustrating and dangerous as cancer to get her attention. And Rolita surrendered. If you get a chance to be able to ask Rolita her story today, she'll tell you that Jesus changed her life. I close with these thoughts. Our God is certainly able we know that. My question to you is, what is it that you need to surrender? What do you need to surrender so that he can be about the business of resurrecting it in your life? You see, when you hang on and try to be in control, God can't resurrect because you're hanging on too tightly. It's when we finally let go and recognize that God's the one that's in control in the first place and that he's got it all under control. And we finally let go and hang on to his promises and his grace that was won on the cross. And as he walked out of that tomb, that's when he can be about the business of resurrecting. So wrestle through that question this week, this month, this year. What is it that you need to surrender in your life so that God can be about the business of resurrecting in you? When Jesus was with Mary and Martha, just before Lazarus walked out of the tomb, he said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's the question, isn't it? Do you believe that? It says that two-thirds of Americans believe it. But does it matter for your life, both today and for eternity? I'm here to tell you, it does. And if you still have a few questions, I'd encourage you to ask a lady by the name of Rolita. 
Maybe ask the person sitting next to you this morning. Maybe go back and read through Scripture and hear again the stories about Jairus and the centurion and the widow. And maybe, just maybe, ask the man who was thrown on the bones of Elisha if there's anything our God can't do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for the privilege of being able to gather together in your house. It's amazing to us that the God of the universe, the one who breathed life into us, continues to be actively involved in our lives that pursues us relentlessly all the way to a gruesome death on a cross. And even as your disciples sat in a room scared to death and the women showed up at the tomb to anoint your body and the chief priests and the Pharisees argued about trying to figure out how to keep somebody from stealing your body. They were all raw. Because at the end of the day, Jesus, nothing could hold you not even the grave. And because you walked out of that grave, we have hope for today and the promise of eternity. So God, we thank you for the reminder of the stories that we heard, stories of resurrecting power. But we also recognize that in this life, we will experience death, but we don't stay there. That's not how the story ends. And so God, we thank you that we can be people of confidence and peace and hope because of you. These things we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen.